This is Eric Lloyd, Master's Student in Clinical Psychology, Neuropsych Concentration. Just reading the other half of this chapter, Chapter 1, Psychology of Women, Half the Human Experience, by Janet Shilby Hyde and Nicole Else Quest. This book was published in 2013 and was part of the undergraduate studies. Sources of Sex Bias in Psychological Research Research in the psychology of women is progressing at a rapid pace. Certainly, we will be able to provide you with much important information about the psychology of women in this book, but there are still more questions yet to be answered and have already been answered. With research on the psychology of women expanding so rapidly, many important discoveries will be made in the next 10 or 20 years. Therefore, someone who takes a course on the psychology of women should do more than just learn what is currently known about women. It is even more profitable to gain the skills to become a sophisticated consumer of psychological research. That is, it is very important to be able to evaluate future studies of women that you may find in newspapers, magazines, or scholarly journals, or on the internet. To do this, you need to develop at least three skills know how psychologists go about doing research, be aware of the ways in which sex bias may affect research, <clears throat> and three, uh, I guess that could also be gender bias, and three, be aware of problems that may exist in research on gender roles or the psychology of women. In general, one of the most valuable things you can get from a college education is the development of critical thinking skills. The feminist perspective encourages critical thinking about psychological research and theory. The following discussion is designed to help you develop these skills. How psychologists do research. Figure 1.4 is a diagram of the process that psychologists go through in doing research shown in rectangles. The diagram also indicates points at which sex bias may enter, shown in ovals. The process, in brief, is generally this. The scientist starts with some theoretical model, whether a formula, f formal model, such as agenda schema theory, or merely a set of personal assumptions. Based on the model or assumptions, the science, scientist then formulates a question. The purpose of the research is to answer that question. Next, she or he designs the research, which involves several sub-steps. A behavior must be selected, a way to measure the behavior must be devised, a group of appropriate participants must be chosen, and a research design must be developed. One of these sub-steps, finding a way to measure the behavior is probably the most fundamental aspect of psychological research, finding a way to measure the behavior. Two interesting examples of measuring behavior relevant to the psychology of women are the test and measure attitudes towards women on a scale from traditional to egalitarian and those that assess attitudes towards rape. That's chapter 14. Here's the model here. 1.4, figure 1.4, for an example of how to do research, or a flow chart, <clears throat> it has things here such as the theoretical model, you formulate a question, uh, see, if the, uh, the, see if the model is biased, uh, after formulating the question, what ties into that is ask only certain questions to formulate that question. Next, design the research. After that, it goes to collect the data, or it could uh, go to choose a behavior and a way to measure it, choose the participants, choose a research design, and then collect the data. <clears throat> 
what goes into collecting the data also entails experimental effects, um, as discussed before, the testing effects or tester effect, administrator effects, and observer effects, the act of observing. Analyze the data statistically. Interpret the results. What goes into interpreting the results is if there's a biased interpretation. Publish the results. What goes into publishing the results is publish only significant statistics. <clears throat> and all of these on, on the right are biases. And from publishing the results, it goes to results read by scientists and incorporated into the body of scientific knowledge. Uh, what also goes into that is selective use of studies confirming, conforming to bias, to the bias of a scientist, of scientists, or female scientists considered less authoritative, authoritative. And then all of that body of scientific knowledge those results that all that goes into ties all the way back into another theoretical model. The next step is for the scientists to collect data. Back reading the chapter now. The data are then analyzed statistically and the results are interpreted. Next, the scientist publishes the results which are read by other scientists and incorporated into the body of scientific knowledge and also put into textbooks. Finally, the system comes full circle because the results are fed into the theoretical models that other scientists will use in formulating new research. Now, let's consider some of the ways in which sex bias, bias that affect understanding the psychology of women or of gender roles, may enter into this process, Kaplan and Kaplan, 2009. Bias theoretical model. The theoretical model or set of assumptions the scientist begins with has a profound effect on the outcome of the research. Sex bias may enter if the scientist begins with a bias theoretical model. Perhaps the best example of a bias theoretical model is psychoanalytic theory formulated by Freud, see chapter two. A person with psychoanalytic orientation might design research to document the presence of penis envy or masochism or immature superego in women. Someone with a different theoretical orientation wouldn't even think to ask such questions. You need to become sensitive to the theoretical orientation of a scientist reporting a piece of research. And sometimes the theoretical orientation isn't stated. It has to be ferreted out because that, that orientation affects the rest of the research and the conclusions that are drawn. What questions are asked? The questions a scientist asks are shaped not only by a theoretical model, but also by gender role stereotypes. Bias may enter when only certain questions are asked and others ignored, partly as a result of stereotypes. For example, there are many studies of fluctuations in women's mood over monthly cycles. However, until recently, no one had thought to ask whether men also might experience monthly mood fluctuations. See, for example, Kimura and Hampson, 1994. Reading the research, one might get the impression that women are moody and men are not. But the research appears to indicate this only because no one has investigated men's mood shifts. Stereotypes about women and men have thus influenced the kinds of questions that have been investigated scientifically. Feminist scholars advocate an important method for overcoming the problems of biased theoretical models and stereotyped research questions. Go to the community of people 
to be studied and ask them about their lives and what these significant questions are. For example, research on lesbians might be limited if it is conducted by heterosexual women working from theories developed by heterosexual men. It is better scientific practice to begin by asking lesbians for input on the research design. Theories can be built at a later stage. Once a firm foundation has been laid beginning from the women's own experiences and perspectives. Sex bias in psychological tests. As shown in figure 1.4, the next step in psychological research is designing the research, which in turn involves three steps. Choosing a behavior or psychological trait and a way to measure it, choosing the participants, and choosing a research design. Let's first consider, consider the step that involves choosing a behavior or trait in a way and a way to measure it. Psychological measurement may take many forms. Psychological measurement, I'll just read the definition. The process of assigning numbers to people's characteristics such as aggressiveness or intelligence. If the researcher wants to measure aggressive behavior in preschool children, the measurement technique may involve having trained observers sit unobstructively, unobtrusively in a preschool classroom and make check marks on a research form every time the child engages in an aggressive act. Here, however, we will concentrate on psychological tests, some of which have been the objects of sharp criticism for problems of sex bias. Baker and Mason, 2010. Let's consider as an example, the mathematics portion of the SAT, which is taken widely by high school seniors who are planning to attend college. The SAT math has been criticized a great deal on the ground that it is biased against women. In 2010, for example, women taking it scored an average of 500 compared with an average of 534 for men, College Board 2010. How could such a test be biased against women? One major issue is the content and wording of questions. If the content of an item involves situations that men experience more frequently, or requires knowledge to which men have more access, then the item is sex biased. An example, as an example, consider the, fo consider the following item, which actually appeared on the SAT in 1986. A high school basketball team has won 40% of its first 15 games. Beginning with the 16th game, how many games in a row does the team now have to win in order to have a 55% winning record? It has all the different answers here. 3A, 5 for B, 6 for C, 11 for D, and 15 for E. Males who have more experience with team sports and computing win-loss records have an advantage. There is a direct al algebraic solution, which a female could do if she had mastered algebra, but it is time-consuming and the test is timed. A male might say, I know that 11 out of 20 is, 55, is a 55% record. Will that work? Yes. The answer is five. If females score lower than males on a particular psychological test, then there often are two possible interpretations. Females are not as skilled at the ability being measured, or two, the gender difference simply indicates that the test itself contained biased items. Sex bias in the choice of a sample. Good evidence exists that bias occurs in choosing participants for psychological research. In particular, males are used more frequently as participants than females are. For example, in 1970, the journal 
Psychophysiology. In the journal Psychophysiology, 38% of the articles reported on male-only studies, and in 1990, the percentage was still 35%, Gannon et al., 1992. Some entire areas of research have had this problem. A good example is the classic research on achievement motivation, which is based on males only, McLean et al., 1953. In Milgram's 1965-1974 classic study of obedience to authority, in which people, because the experimenter told them to do so, 17 of 18 experiments were based on all-male samples. Such, practice, such practices can create whole areas of research that have little or no relevance to women's lives. Researchers can make a second error that compounds the effects of using an all-male sample, the error of overgeneralization. That is, having used a single gender, single gender, usually all male sample, the researchers then discuss and interpret the results as if they were true of all people, male and female. So overgeneralization. The definition is a the book definition that it provides is a research error in which the results are said to apply to a broader group than the one sample. For example, saying that Results from an all-male sample are true for all people. Feminist psychologists raised a ruckus about these all-male designs. So did other feminist scientists, and they joined with women in Congress to bring about the change. One result was the Women's Health Equity Act of 1990, Blumenthal and Wood, 1997, which mandated, among other things, that women must be included in clinical research trials, such, such as trials on the effectiveness of drugs. Before that, for example, the research conducted to determine whether small daily doses of aspirin would ward off heart attacks was based on an all-male sample. What was a woman to do if she wanted to reduce her risk of heart attack? The problem with this kind of bias is that it creates not a psychology of human behavior, but rather a psychology of male behavior. Yet the problem is even worse because psychologists have been guilty of an over-reliance on college student samples. Such samples are typically homogenous in several ways, including age. Most participants are between 18 and 22. Ethnicity, mostly white, and social class, mostly middle class. Feminist psychologists argue for the importance of recognizing the diversity of human experience. Your family's ethnic group and social class influenced the environment in which you grew up and therefore influenced your behavior. Feminist psychologists urge researchers to use samples that will allow an exploration of ethnic and social class diversity. Sex bias in sex bias of research design. Research methods in psychology can be roughly classified into two categories: laboratory experiments and naturalistic observations. In the laboratory experiment, the research participant is brought into the psychologist's laboratory, and his or her behavior is manipulated in some way in order to study the phenomena in question. In contrast with naturalistic observations, researchers observe people's behavior as it occurs in natural settings and do not attempt to manipulate the behavior. In practice, the distinction between these categories is sometimes muddied. For example, it is possible to conduct an experiment in a naturalistic setting. Nonetheless, the distinction between the two, category, between the two basic categories is useful. Some scholars argue that laboratory experiments are inherently sex-biased, although this point is controversial. Kaplow and Conrad, 1989. This question will be considered in greater detail later in the chapter. It is also possible to talk about quasi-experimental designs. 
quasi meaning not quite. The term refers to designs in which there may be two or possibly more groups so that the design looks like an experiment, but the experimenter did not manipulate which group each person was assigned to so that there is no true experiment. A good example is studies of gender differences. There are two groups, males and females, but certainly the researcher did not randomly assign people to be in one or another group at the beginning of the research session. Studies of gender differences are not true experiments, but rather quasi-experiments. Go ahead and read that definition. Quasi-experimental design. A research design that uses two or more groups, but participants are not randomly assigned to groups, so it is not a true experiment. An example is two group designs comparing males and females. Experimenter effects. In each step of research in which the data are collected, two important kinds of bias may enter, experimenter effects and observer effects. Experimenter effects occur when some characteristic of the experiment affects the way respondents behave and thus affects the outcome of the experiment. For example, in one experiment, a sex survey was administered by either a male or a female research assistant. Men reported more sexual partners when they had a female researcher, Fisher, 2007. In another ex experiment, a test of, of rape myth acceptance was administered by a woman who was either provocatively or conservatively dressed, Bryant et al., 2001. Answers to the questionnaire differed significantly depending on the experimenter's clothing. It is rather disturbing to realize that an experimenter might have different outcomes depending on whether the experimenter was a man or a woman, black or white, or dressed in one set of clothes or another. The problem of experimenter effects is not unsolvable. The situation can be handled by having several experimenters, for example, half of them female, half of them male, collect uh, the data. <clears throat> this should balance out any effects due to the gender of the experimenter and demonstrate whether the gender of the experimenter did have an effect on the participant's behavior. Unfortunately, this procedure, this procedure is seldom, seldom used, so <laughs> seldom used, mostly because it is rather complicated. Observer effects. Another important bias that may enter at the stage of data collection is observer effects. Observer effects, sometimes also called greater bias, occur when the researcher's expectations for the outcome of the research influence his or her observations and recording of the data. Hoyt and Kearns, 1999, Lakes and Hoyt, 2009, Rosenthal, 1966. For example, in a classic study, observers, in a classic study, observers, really the research participants, would account the number of turning movements by planetaria, flatworms. Half of the observers had been led to expect a great deal of turning, the other half very low. The observers who expected a great deal of turning reported twice as many turns as the observers who expected little. Cordero and Ison, 1963. In psychology, as many as other areas of life, what you expect is what you get. Observer effects may be a source of bias in gender research. In particular, scientists are no more immune than lay people to having stereotype expectations for the behavior of females and males. These stereotyped expectations might lead scientists to find stereotype gender differences in behavior where there are none. As an example, consider research on gender differences in aggression among preschool children. If observers expect more aggression from boys, that may be just what they observe, even though the boys and girls behaved identically.
This is analogous to the observers who expected more turns from the planaria and found just that. The technical procedure that is generally used to guard against observer effects is the blind study. It simply means that observers are kept unaware of, blind to, which experimental group participants are in, so that the observer's expectations cannot affect the outcome. Unfortunately, the blind method is virtually impossible in gender research as the gender of a person is all, almost always obvious from appearance, and therefore the observer cannot be blind to, to it or unaware of it. One exception is infants and small children, whose gender is notoriously difficult to determine, at least when clothed. This fact was used in a clever study that provides some information on whether observer effects do influence gender research. The study is discussed in detail in chapter six, but in brief, adults rated behavior of an infant on a videotape, Conjury and Conjury, 1976. Half the observers were told the infant was a male and the other half were told it was a female. When the infant showed a negative emotional response, those who thought the infant was a male tended to rate the emotion as anger whereas those observing a female rated her as showing fear. The observers rated behavior differently depending on whether they thought they were observing a male or a female. Bias in Interpretations once the scientist has collected the data and analyzed them statistically, the results must be interpreted. Sometimes the interpretation a scientist makes is at best a large leap of faith away from the results. Therefore, it is also a stage at which bias may enter. Hagarty and Prado, 2010. As an example, let us consider a fairly well-documented phenomena of psychological gender differences. A class, of, a class of students takes its first exam in introductory psychology. Immediately after taking the exam, but before getting the results back, the students are asked to estimate how many points out of a possible 100 they got on the exam. I remember this one. On average, males will estimate that they got higher scores than females, uh, than females will estimate they got. See chapter three. At this point, the data have been collected and analyzed statistically. It can be stated neutrally that there are statistically significant gender differences, with men estimating more points than women. The question is, how do we interpret that result? The standard interpretation is that it indicates that women lack self-confidence or just have low confidence in their abilities. The interpretation, the interpretation is not made, although it is just as logical, is that men have unrealistically high expectations for their own performance. The point is that, given a statistically significant gender difference, such as such a result can often be interpreted in two opposite ways, one of which is favorable to men, one of which is favorable to women. A persistent tendency has existed in psychology to make interpretations that are favorable to men. These interpretations are essentially based on a female deficit model. Sometimes there is no way of verifying which interpretation is right. As happens in the example above, there is a way, way because we can find out how the students actually did on an exam. Those results indicate that women and girls underestimate their scores by about as much as men and boys overestimate theirs. 
Cole et al., 1999, Mednick and Thomas, 1993. Thus, the second interpretation is as accurate as the first. Becoming sensitive to the point at which scientists go beyond their data to interpret them, and becoming aware of when those interpretations may be biased is extremely important. Another example of bias in interpretation occurs in research on gender differences in language, chapter 5. And I'll just go over the definition here. Female deficit model, a theory or interpretation of research in which women's behavior is seen as deficient. Publishing significant results only. That's another, that's another big one here. One of the, once the data have been analyzed and interpreted, the next step is to publish the results. There is a strong tendency in psychological research to publish significant results only. This does not necessarily mean significant in the sense of important. It means significant in the sense of being the result of a statistical test that reaches uh, 0.05 level, that reaches the 0.05 level of significance or higher, 95%, 99% confidence interval or, or above that. What are the implications of this tendency for our understanding of gender roles and psychology of women and the psychology of women? It means that there is a tendency to report statistically significant differences and to omit mention of non-significant gender differences. That is, we tend to hear about it when males and females differ, but we do not tend to hear about it when males and females are the same. Bringing us back to one of the first themes discussed in the book, in the introduction. Thus, there would be a bias towards emphasizing gender differences and ignoring gender similarities. This bias may also enter into psychology of women research, such as menstrual cycle studies, a point to be discussed in detail in chapter 11. <clears throat> Other biases. The final two biases shown in figure 1.1 are fairly self-explanatory and require little discussion here. There is a tendency for reports by female scientists to be considered less authoritative than reports by male scientists. This would introduce bias, particularly when combined with bias due to experimental effects as discussed previously. Research on whether this is really a problem has produced mixed results. Goldberg, 1968, Swim et al., 1989. And so these concerns are somewhat speculative. Also, another kind of bias is introduced if scientists have a tendency to remember and use, their use in their work studies that conform to their own biases or ideas and to ignore those that do not. Conclusion. We have discussed a number of problems with psychological research that may affect our understanding of women and men. Of course, these problems are not present in every study in the area. And certainly, we do not mean to suggest that all psychological research is worthless. The point is to learn to think critically about biases that may, that may or may not be present when you are reading reports of research. Thinking critically about the theoretical orientation of a scientist and about biased interpretations of results is important. A more general point emerges from this discussion of sex bias and research methods in psychology. Traditional psychology has historically viewed itself as an objective and value-free science. Today, many psychologists, feminist psychologists among them, question whether psycho psychological research is objective and value-free. Paplau and Conrad, 1989. They pointed out that they point out that psychological research might more appropriately be viewed as an interaction between researcher and research participant that occurs in a particular context. To that interaction, the research brings certain values that may influence its outcome. In short, the results cannot be totally objective. Psychology, of course, 
is not the only science that is claimed to be objective and value-free when it isn't. Another example is physics and its groundbreaking discoveries of the ways to generate nuclear power. These discoveries can be used to manufacture weapons capable, capable of annihilating thousands, or they can be used to generate, generate electricity for cities. Values are closely connected with science. Feminist Alternatives All the preceding criticisms are important and you should be aware of them. But we need to go beyond those criticisms to offer some cr constructive alternatives. In doing so, we can think about gender fair research and feminist research. I'll go ahead and read those last uh, five pages uh, in the last video for this chapter. Uh, thank you.